This is for two particular viewers that have asked me to do this. I've tried to avoid, I've tried to avoid even trying to teach this y'all because uh, it's not a comfortable thing to teach. But since you asked me, I will do it. Okay. I have avoided the book of Malachi and Zechariah to the best of my ability, but I know I'm going to have to hit those books eventually. Okay. But I don't want y'all thinking I'm doing this to ask you for it. Okay. I shouldn't have to ask you for it. You know, if you're getting fed, that's, that's your deal to be obedient to God. But there's two of you that asked me to teach on money, your finances, because you don't understand. And I'm your teacher and I'm going to teach you on it. Okay. So here you go. I hope this will help you. Okay. So the uncomfortable topic, okay, that everybody hates. So the Bible talks extensively about money and makes this big overarching point. It says how we handle material wealth is a reliable indicator of our spiritual health. So in brief, here's what the Bible says about money. Okay, I'm going to go on and do these. Uh, I'm going to go through three things with you because I, cause I don't want to do it again. Okay, <laughs> unless I have to by God. Okay. So money is a blessing. Number one, write that down. Excuse me. Money is a blessing. Your money's a blessing, okay? Scripture clearly teaches that all wealth comes from the Lord, okay? Whatever you have. God is gracious and generous to shower good things on his creatures. So many of the great saints of the Bible, Abraham, Job, Solomon, for example, possessed enormous riches. But the blessing of money is surely not the only way God blesses his people. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. In fact, the Bible says in so many words, pity the poor individual whose wealth is solely financial. It means you put all your trust and faith in your money. The Bible says, pity that, pity that poor person. Okay, feel sorry for him. <laughs> okay, so money is a, money is a trust. Okay, the Bible is clear that God is the owner of everything. Psalm 24, 1. So we are only temporary stewards or short-term managers of the assets that God places in your care. Okay, it doesn't all belong to you. He put it there. Okay. This is another thing. Money is a test. Your money is a test. Jesus put it this way. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, 34. So in other words, humans naturally wrap their hearts around whatever they value the most. Thus, money reliably shows what a person loves values and trusts in okay what you do with your money shows what you love what you value and what you trust in okay money is also a danger a danger so money has a way of making us feel invincible psalms 52 7 the smug self-satisfied soul can begin to think why do I need to trust God when I have a financial portfolio that is growing by the leaps and bounds? Okay, that is why God warns those that he's blessed with worldly wealth against pride and forgetfulness. Deuteronomy 8, 17 through 18. Forgetful what? Forgetting God. Okay, that is also why Jesus talked about how difficult it is for those with great wealth to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mark 10, 23. So is money a blessing? Absolutely. Is money also a burden and a danger? Absolutely. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Okay, the other thing, money is a tool. It's a tool. So Jesus commanded us to be generous, Acts 20, 35. And he challenged us to store up treasures in heaven. Okay, Matthew 6, 20. So someone has wittily paraphrased his word this way. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. 
Okay, now I'm going to show you in this book some things you can do, what God expects you to do with handling your money. If you can see it here, hold on, man, I got to put this pen, lid on this pen. It says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Okay, let's see if we can see this right here. I can't even see it. Let's see. Um, this is... Uh, Okay, it says, be generous, 1 Corinthians 9, 13 through 14. Uh, be content, 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. I can't hardly see it. You cannot serve both God and money, Matthew 6, 24. The love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. Money never satisfied Despise the greedy people, Ecclesiastics 5.10. Silver and gold, meaning your money, belong to God. Haggai uh, 2.8. Matthew 3.9-10. God will, will reward us when we manage well. Okay, that's all I can see, y'all. So let's go on to the next, the next lesson. I sure can't see that. Okay, the next one is reasons to give. To give to who? To the needy, to to the needy, or to God's kingdom, to uh, anything that you know. Let's let's learn it. So, no doubt you've heard. I'm put this right here so you can see it. No doubt you've heard the complaint. Why do certain preachers and churches talk nonstop about giving? So perhaps you've even said that yourself. While it's true that some overemphasize the subject, it's also true that the Bible talks frequently about money and giving. Jesus, in fact, talked about. Um, these matters more than he did about heaven and hell when she did. Here are three primary reasons giving is good. I got to this over here. Number one, giving imitates God. Giving. Giving imitates God. It's God's very nature to give. Matthew 7, 11, write these verses down. He is the giver of life, Nehemiah 9, 6. He is the giver of food, Psalms 136, 25. He gives wisdom, strength, relief, victory. So in truth, every good gift is from God, James 1, 17. And of course, God's greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ, John 3, 16. In Jesus, God not only gave us all we could ever need, but gave us the deepest desire of our hearts. When we give, we resemble our heavenly father. Okay. Giving expresses faith. It expresses faith. Mm, just over here. Giving expresses faith. Okay. So it's easy to talk about faith in a theoretical abstract way. However, in giving, to the work of God, you put your money where your mouth is. Okay, it's easy for people to say, I have faith, I trust God, I trust this, but it don't have to be me, y'all. But do you give to whoever's feeding you in the kingdom of God? Do you trust God that much with your little bit of money to give to the kingdom of God, to his workers? So it says to put your your mouth where your, uh, where your faith is. <laughs> it's easy to talk about faith. In an abstract way, however, in giving to the work of God, we put our money where our mouths are. So giving is a tangible display of the beliefs that we profess unless one is convicted of the truth of the Bible. That is that all my stuff actually belongs to God, that people are lost without Christ, and that this world is not all there is, and that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5.10 so why should I give my hard-earned money to support the work of God's kingdom? One of the best love stories of the gospel is Jesus marveling over the faith of a, of the, uh, and generosity of a poor widow at the Jerusalem temple. Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. Okay, she trusted God that much. Okay, so giving erodes greed. It erodes greed. Okay, so it has been suggested that if we have a possession about which we think it would kill me to lose that, 
Perhaps you need to give that thing away before it does kill you. So giving loosens the grip that money and things sometimes have on our hearts. As a spiritual discipline, giving combats the ever-present temptation of materialism. Luke 12, 15. Hold on, y'all. Let's see what's going on here. So here's some Bible verses. That's better. Uh, Let's see what this says. A person needs to experience three conversions. The conversion of the head, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the pocketbook. Okay, here's, you can read this right here. Reasons that you need to give. Okay. Malachi 3, 8, 9, giving is commanded by God. I told you I try not to go in the book of Malachi, but I'm going to have to because I'm teaching God's word and that's part of his commandments. It's part of what you got to do. Uh, giving supports the Lord's work. Malachi 3, 10. Giving shows love. John 3, 16. Sure does. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Giving prompts thanksgiving. You can see it. Giving helps the poor. Giving results in blessing. If you can't see that, that's Malachi 3.10, um, Acts 20.35, and 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8. Um, and the other one is giving is a privilege, a demonstration of grace, 2 Corinthians 8, 3 through 6. Okay, so it's very important to give to the Lord, and I should go ahead and hit on the book of Malachi while I'm doing this so that I don't have to do it again. I don't want to do it again. And it's also in Zechariah. So there's also, if you look through the book of Malachi, you can study this yourself. He talks about polluted offerings or basically robbing God. Okay, so giving God our best. You can read that. Let's read uh, 12 and 13. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and his fruit is food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. You know what? Yeah, I'm right. What a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Okay, let's see what he's talking about there. He's talking about to offer God less than our best is unworthy of his holy name. And yet on our own, we have nothing to offer him. So Christ is the one who comes as the purifier, the refiner of his people, that they being made clean by him may offer sacrifice and worship acceptable to God. For that reason, we can and must give our best to the Lord, always submitting to the work of the Lord as a refiner and purifier. So we do this through worshiping God from a purified heart, serving him from clean motives, committing to him true worship and avoiding mere uh, formalism. So this is a lifelong process. We must allow God to begin his work in us. Another important aspect of giving our best to God is tithing. Okay, although some excuse, um, the, although some excuse themselves from tithing by saying that is no longer applies under the new covenant, remember that it was part of the Abrahamic life of faith long before the law was given to Moses and the Israelites. To fail to tithe is to dishonor and rob God. That's what it does, y'all. I pay mine too. To dishonor and rob God. And I'm not robbing God because um, it's a bad thing. So as faithful people of God, people um, who desire to give him our best. Let me read that again. As faithful people of God, people who desire to give him our best, we need to acknowledge that the God that God owns everything. The tenth that we give back to him through tithing is already his. It already belongs to him. It's not yours. So remember, it's Leviticus 27, 30. Remember, tithing is more than a part of the Mosaic law. It is a timeless covenant of privilege to exercise in joyous faith. Not as a grudging legal requirement. You do it because you, you want to and you love God and you want to obey his commandments. It's to make him happy. So let each one... Give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, so that's in the book of Malachi. Um, he goes on to say, let me make sure I hit it all. And, and it's also in Zechariah, but I just don't want to. Okay, 3, 8 through 12. Did I read that? 8 through 12 is going to knock this out. Chapter 3, Malachi, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open your open um, for you windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will not be able to contain it. Okay. So it's talking about learning to give to God, having faith. The principle of giving to God, excuse me, I'm back y'all. The principle um, of giving to God is found throughout the scripture. God certainly does not need our money, but he knows that we need to give it as an act of faith and obedience. Self-centeredness and stinginess shortcut the blessings God wants to open on us. So when we fail to give God our tithes, which is 10% of what we earn, and our offerings, which is love gifts that acknowledge God's goodness, we rob him and we rob ourselves. So there is a considerable argument about whether the principle of tithing um, carries over into the New Testament living. The early church seemed to understand that their lives were to be completely given to the Lord, meaning that all they possess now belongs to God, regardless of the circ of the uh, system. Semantics, it's hard to find a person who really loves the Lord and, and does not give to him. Okay, it's, it is hard to find a person who loves the Lord and doesn't completely follow his commandments. Okay, and doesn't want to uh, support his, his, uh, his work, y'all, his, his uh, kingdom. Okay, this last one here. So the Bible passage reveals that God told his people they were under a curse because they robbed him by not giving their tithes and offerings. So if they would turn from their sin and obey the covenant in the area of giving, God would open the windows of heaven and pour out a great blessing. In addition, God promised to rebuke the devourer. That is, he promised to destroy the locusts so that they would not be able to devour the crops. So finally, God promised that other people would call such obedient people blessed. Some people spiritualize this passage of scripture and say that it only applies uh, to spiritual blessings. No, but God was clearly talking about both spiritual and economic or material blessings. God knows we need it. You know, he knows that. Although there is no consensus in the contemporary church as to the New Testament applicably the principle of, um, of, of the principle of tithing, where am I at? The testing God financially, the promise, the God's promise rebuking those things. Let me read that again, y'all. Although there is no consensus in the contemporary church as to the New Testament applicably of the principle of tithing, of testing God financially, of God's promise rebuking of those things that devour finances, or of God's providing financially for those who faithfully give, there is general agreement that the New Testament teaches us to give substantially to the Lord. It is also agreed that he is a God who delights to respond with gracious provision, especially to meet essential needs. Okay, it goes on to tell you, don't doubt God's goodness. The people complained against God's saying, said it was useless to serve him. And that keeping God's word didn't really matter in life. The people didn't think that God treated the wicked any different from the way he treated the righteous. They thought God was unfair in Malachi thirteen eighteen. if you go on. However, God told them that he has a book of remembrance where he keeps track of all the people who love him and obey his laws. Your name is in a book. Okay, just like my name is in a book. For, for uh, uh, teaching you God's word. Everything I do when I make a video, open my mouth, 
my name gets written in the book telling them what I did for you, what I did for his kingdom. When I go to the to the uh, shelters, my name gets written in a book, okay, because I'm working for the kingdom of God. And every time you obey the Lord and however you obey him, your name gets written in the book. When you don't obey him, that gets written down too. Okay, you can read that Malachi 13, 18. All right, let's go over here so we can knock this out. Characteristics of those who love money. They fall into temptation. They give into foolish and harmful desires. They wander from the faith. Oh, I can't read this. Um, they are never satisfied. Ecclesiastics 5.10. They are cursed. Malachi 3 9, we just read it. They experience much grief. 1 Timothy 6 10. Okay, so here's some things right here. Characteristics of those who love money. Illegal sinful acts. Because of greed, Laban cheated his son in law Jacob. Genesis 31 34. So they got they do sinful acts. They they endless, endless discontent, nagging worry. They got worry, 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 worry. That they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it because they've already robbed God. Personal misery, family woes, and apostasy. The worst consequence um, of unchecked greed, loving and trusting money, eventually replaces loving and trusting God. That's the apostasy. Said in the last day, there will be great apostasy in the book of Revelation. People falling away from the church, falling away from supporting God's kingdom, falling away from God altogether because of your, what has taken over this world? Money. Okay, my phone's getting ready to cut off. So I hope that this helped you. I hope you can write the scriptures down. Go do the rest yourself. I would go on to, is wealth evil? I mean, and, and, but I, I got I to gotta stop. And then we can go on to work as God's gift and all this and that. But right now I got to stop. I hope that helped you. And I hope that each one of you um, are being obedient to God. I know I have to be obedient to God, you know, and thank you to those of you that are being obedient and choosing my ministry to support. I'm glad that you're learning and growing and that it's helping you. All right. I hope that helped you out. I mean, I'm not going to mention your name. I'm sorry. I hope this helped you out. God bless each one of you. If you don't know Jesus, ask him. And yes, we do. Sorry to tell you, we got to be obedient in God's whole entire word and everything. All right. God bless y'all.